All right, I think we're about ready to get going. Hopefully people can hear me. Scott Hamilton here. Uh, we got over 20 participants, so that's great. And hopefully more people will continue to join. So yeah, everyone, thanks for uh, coming to our first ever, our inaugural Moss Landing virtual seminar series. So yeah, thanks for all attending. And thanks to our speaker, Emily Miller, for being willing to uh, be our guinea pig and uh, go first and give this a try. So just a few uh, things before we get going. Uh, remember all audience participants, you're gonna be muted throughout the seminar. So please don't uh, turn on your video or try to uh, share your screen during the talk. At the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask uh, live questions, just like in a normal seminar. And so when the speaker's finished with their talk, uh, you can use the Zoom's raised hand feature, which is on the participants pane, to notify the meeting host that you'd like to ask the speaker a question. They will then unmute you and allow you to ask that question. Uh, another way you can do it, you can also uh, submit written questions through the chat feature in that chat pane. And uh, as well, that's another way then the, the speaker will be able to read those questions and, and answer them. So uh, just a little bit about our speaker's background bef uh, before we get going. So uh, Emily Miller, she did her undergraduate degree at uh, UC Berkeley and finished that in 2006. Then she went uh, to the East Coast in New York and spent time at Columbia University where she did her master's in conservation biology. She finished that in 2010. And there she did research uh, looking at species interactions and in blue monkeys and black and white colobus monkeys in Kenya which sounds really exciting. And then she came back to the West Coast uh, for her PhD. Uh, that was at UC Davis and she finished that in 2017. And she did her dissertation research um, studying green and white sturgeons. So uh, tagging and tracking, looking at their movements and spatial niche partitioning in San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento River. And then for the past two years, Emily has been an assistant research scientist in the conservation and research department at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And she's worked on a variety of projects, such as studying the historical ecology of sea turtles and marine macroalgae, um, studying the movement patterns of marine fishes in the ocean and uh, getting involved in some studies of different fisheries issues. And she's really interested in studying how interactions between organisms and their environment change over space and time. Especially, she enjoys asking questions that try to understand migration ecology in ways that'll inform conservation. And she mainly uses biotelemetry techniques and stable isotope ecology. Uh, she also uh, is very interested in, in ways of communicating science, uh, especially through data visualizations and art. And so you know, we're very excited to have Emily speak today. And her talk is titled Ocean Ecology of Steelhead as Revealed by Pop-Up Satellite Archival Tags. So with that, uh, we'll give it to Emily and uh, off you go. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm um, excited, excited to talk about this work with you and, and to do it over Zoom. It's great we can do that. Just a moment.
All right, there we go. I think we're back. Thank you for your patience. I'm going to talk about steelhead ocean movements as revealed by pop-up satellite archival tags. And this project is a collaboration between the Monterey Bay Aquarium, where I work, as well as with uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks, uh, NOAA Fisheries based in Santa Cruz office, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So this is a large project that has a lot of essential players um, in order to carry it out. So to give you some background, the typical salmonid life cycle is anadromous, meaning adults lay eggs in the freshwater habitat, but migrate to the ocean um, later in life. The alvins, which are the yolk sac fry, grow into par, which are those juveniles with spots at the bottom, and then undergo smultification that prepares their osmoregulatory system for saltwater. They exit the estuaries, uh, into the ocean where they grow up and mature into adults and return to the freshwater to spawn. And most salmonid species are semelparous, meaning that they die after spawning. Oncorhynchus mycus, or O. mycus, um, are a salmon salmonid. Uh, they are in the same genus as uh, the Pacific salmon, but they differ from traditional salmonid life cycle models uh, in that Within the same species, they have two different adult morphotypes with distinct life cycles. So the rainbow trout, the image at the top, uh, is resident, meaning instead of out migrating to the ocean, uh, rainbow trout stay in streams and mature and then spawn, while steelhead, the lower image, uh, follow the more typical salmonid life cycle, exiting the rivers as smolts, growing in the ocean before returning to freshwater to spawn. Uh, it's a complex suite of genetic and environmental factors that determine if a juvenile will become a rainbow trout or a steelhead in adulthood. Another distinctive feature is that they are iteroparous, so they spawn multiple times within their lifetime, or at least they have the potential to. This complex diagram shows that uh, omycus aren't just flexible in their adult morphotype, which is those two images rep represented by the at the bottom there. Um, but they're flexible at all life stages. So the number of years, for example, a juvenile par uh, stays uh, in the stream before maturing is a flexible feature. And where they mature is also flexible. It could be in the stream. It could be in an estuary. Um, the number of years an adult steelhead spends at sea before returning to spawn is another flexible feature. And because they are iteroparous, the number of times adults spawn throughout their lifetime is another thing that varies. So all these flexible features have trade-offs associated with them, and the costs and benefits can shift depending on environmental conditions. So having this flexibility of life history strategies provides this portfolio effect. So managers want to maintain all of these strategies in a population to ensure that it persists. Uh, we're interested in one specific life stage uh, for this study, the adult steelhead, and after it has spawned, which is when it's called a kelt, post-spawning adult. And specifically females um, is what we're focused on since female Celts contribute uh, greatly to the population abundance. So steelhead range across the Pacific coasts of the Northern hemisphere. Uh, within that range, they face many freshwater threats, uh, including river barriers, loss of floodplain, habitat, entrainment uh, in water export pumps, uh, genetic dilution from hatcheries in the upper right image, uh, and drought, especially in California, that affect uh, passage in these watersheds. But in the ocean, we can't predict how threats like climate change might impact steelhead populations because we just don't know where they go. So for this study, we wanted to answer these questions. Where do the Celts go in the ocean? Do populations from opposite range ends have the same ocean distribution? What pathways do they take within the ocean? And what vertical distributions do they occupy? Are they at the surface? Are they diving deep? And what we basically know from steelhead uh, distributions in the ocean comes from bycatch uh, in the commercial gillnet per se long lane fisheries. Uh, this figure shows the distribution of catches um, that where the ocean is gridded. Um, and it was published in 89 and it's, it's a, the, largely the extent of what uh, we know. So in the autumn, they're caught in the Gulf and the Aleutian Islands. Uh, in winter, they're moving near, nearer to their natal rivers to spawn. 
Um, and that continues into spring with some then returning to the ocean, depending on the river specific runtime. So that all varies across their range. And then by the summer, uh, they've moved further offshore, uh, west, um, north, um, but we don't know, does this distribution include California fish or just fish from Pacific Northwest rivers? Um, and NOAA Fisheries led by Sean Hayes did a study where they tried to figure this out. So they tagged a kelt in Scott Creek, which is near Santa Cruz. Um, and the tag was an archival tag, so it could record temperature. Um, and so we have these probability estimates represented by the colors here um, that inform us about the latitude, but we couldn't really understand too much about longitude. So did this fish over time moving up towards Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska hug the coast or did it go further offshore? But we do know it did make it all the way up uh, to these northern latitudes. Um, possibly Gulf of Alaska, possibly Aleutian Islands, possi possibly the Bering Sea um, or Western Pacific. Uh, and so we'd like to further hone the, our understanding of these movements. And now we can do that because satellite tags uh, have gotten small enough and powerful enough that we can fix these on adult steelhead and answer this question. So that's the satellite tag that is fixed to a harness on an adult steelhead kelp that we tagged um, in Alaska there. So we tagged in two locations to understand uh, both extents of the range, the Seatuck River near Yakutat, Alaska and Scott Creek uh, just north of Santa Cruz. So the Seatuck River near Yakutat, it has this relatively consistent flow because it's fed by a lake. Um, a lot of the water in that lake um, comes from glacier runoff and the glaciers in the area are actually doing pretty well as far as uh, they are not retreating. So it supports these robust salmon populations uh, with a very productive habitat. Scott Creek near Davenport, uh, it, it has more seasonal flow. It empties into an estuary that has a sandbar and it's often blocked um, the flow to get to the ocean by that sandbar. Um, and it takes enough rain, which only happens seasonally in California to, you can see that uh, path of water that's carved out through the sandbar to break that barrier and uh, let the salmon come both in and out uh, for their migrations. So these are both relatively short river systems. Um, the Seatuck River just has an order of magnitude higher mean annual discharge or water volume that's flowing out of it. Uh, the Seatuck River also ha has the largest steelhead fishery in Alaska. Uh, nearly half of steelhead that anglers catch in Alaska are caught in the Seatuck River. Whereas in Scott Creek, the population on this um, California central coast, the distinct population segment is listed as threatened. Whereas in Seatuck, there are at least 6,000 fish um, every year. And in Scott Creek, we have fewer than 200 spawning every year. In addition to smaller population sizes in Scott Creek, the actual individual size is smaller. So for the fish that we tagged in the Seatuck River, they were quite a bit larger, around 77 centimeters total length. And in Scott Creek, they were closer to 64 centimeters total length. Each river system had a weir, so this made it uh, logistically feasible for us to tag. So this is a temporary fence-like structure that stops the passage of fish either up or downstream and allows the agencies, either the Alaska Department of Fish and Game or NOAA um, Fisheries in Santa Cruz to count the number of fish that are moving through this system. And we were able to tag directly in the river in some cases or adjacent to the river. So this was a really great setup. We fixed a harness uh, through the pterygiophores below the dorsal fin and the tag fixes onto that harness and is programmed to pop off um, and float to the surface and then the antenna transmits data to us. So we don't see the data until the entire uh, track of the fish is complete. Uh, we monitor the fish in the river um, after we tag them to make sure they look healthy, happy and moving well before we release them fully. But they, we release them at the same site that we catch them. 
We have done three field seasons so far. And for the tag programming, we uh, had different day lengths for our first field season to see, would this even be successful? But for our second two field seasons, because we, we had success doing it, we programmed all the tags to pop off around 180 days. Most did not stay on that long, um, either from predations or just popping off early, which is a, um, a common feature, um, but we were able to have some success. So to go through our three field seasons and what happened, uh, we put out 16 tags in 2018 in Alaska in SeaTac River, five in 2019 in California, 12 in 2019 in Alaska again. Um, we had pretty good success rate with tags eventually transmitting, uh, but we did have some issues in our first season. There was a firmware issue that we worked with uh, wildlife computers, the tag manufacturer to address, and we're able to um, successfully address that and had pretty good success of fish exiting the river um, the following two seasons. Uh, the first season, those tags popped off in the river and it was unclear exactly what was going on there. Um, so we had trouble identifying in-river mortalities for our first season. We know that there were some. Um, we didn't have any in California and in Alaska for our second season, we had two in-river mortalities um, that were likely eagle and uh, something terrestrial like a bear based on where we found the tags later on. Um, we had a few predator ingestions in the ocean and that could be determined by the light levels going down to nearly zero, the tags record light. And we had two in California, um, some, both of them ectothermic fish so because the temperature didn't increase like it would in a marine mammal's belly. So we know that there was one fish that was consumed and probably by a deep diving shark um, that traveled offshore from uh, Santa Cruz, uh, and then another by a fish that, another fish that went deep into the Monterey Bay Canyon, and we don't know what that was. Um, and in 2019, we had one fish that was consumed by a predator in the ocean that may have been a, a bottom dwelling fish based on the, the depths, um, and it might have been something like a large halibut consuming um, a deceased fish that had sunk. So we're still working to figure out those mortalities. This is the example track of just one fish. It's a, a kelp that we tagged in 2019, and this is our longest deployment. So on the left, you can see the map of the track where the fish went, and it was on for nearly six months, nearly our full deployment there. And this fish traveled westward out to the Aleutian Islands, nearly to the 180 degree meridian there, before turning up into the Bering Sea and looping back. Um, whether this was the return migration, we can't definitively say um, before the tag popped off. Uh, and then on the right, we have the temperature and depth profile. So depth is on the Y axis. Um, and you can see this is a bit patchy, this data. Um, these longer deployments have patchier data. Uh, and the, but one of the main things that we do see here is that uh, this fish is not diving past 25 meters. Um, so it's staying largely at the surface with a few infrequent dives. Um, and this surface oriented paper behavior is uh, something that we've seen in many of the fish in Alaska, as well as California. This is an example track from California. Um, this fish was tagged and only on the fish for maybe two, three weeks uh, and it popped off north of Mendocino. This is a more complete temperature depth profile on the right for this shorter duration of deployment. Uh, and you can see that this fish is, is making deeper dives on the y-axis, it goes down to 150 meters. And this is representative of California fish. So while they are spending most of their time at the surface as well, the California fish we found were making these deeper dives throughout their tracks. If we look at a population, the entire population that we tagged, so 21 fish that exited the river over those three field seasons. Um, if you look towards the bottom right, you'll see those five Alaska fish. The lower two points are ones that the ones that were ingested, and then the other three traveled up. And then you'll see the two 
field seasons of Alaska data are overlaid on top of each other. So they're, all those Alaska fish are from two different field seasons. It's being shown exiting from at the same time. Uh, and we had two fish that made it all the way out to the Aleutian Islands. One that made it out and stopped was in 2018. And then that one that's doing that last loop around was in 2019. So they made it to a similar point um, before that longest deployment um, starts looping back around. The main takeaways uh, from this, these results here um, are that they're generally staying on the continental shelf. Both the Alaska fish and the California fish um, are, for the most part, fairly restricted to the shelf as they're making their migrations. They are also highly directional. So they aren't, they aren't dawdling, they are migrating. Um, these movement pathways are calculated using wildlife computers, GPE-3 geolocation algorithm. And there are some assumptions with any algorithm, um, and there are with these, but we believe these pathways to be pretty reasonable based on the published movement rates um, of steelhead. So if we're still looking at all of our fish together, um, this is basically two histograms turned on their sides, uh, density histograms. Uh, so this is the just the Alaska fish. And on the left side, the dark blue are the depths that they occupied at night. And the light blue on the right are the depths they occupied during daylight hours. And they're pretty similar. Um, they're also very surface focused, surface oriented. So they are in the shallow waters, um, rarely going below 20 meters. Um, very infrequently diving below 20 meters, uh, and it's not differing between day and night. Now, the California fish, uh, this is a different y-axis, so note that they are diving much deeper. They're still very surface oriented, um, but the dives are happening in the daytime. You can see that there is more of those light blue bars um, on the right side of that histogram going down. So they're occupying these lower depths um, in these brief dives. Um, so they're still spending more time at the surface, but they are doing these deeper dives relative to the Alaska fish. And we can see that when we compare the two. So this is a comparison back to back histograms of the Alaska fish on the left and the California fish on the right. And the Alaska fish, the dark green bars, um, you can see that's all above the 50 meter um, line on the left, whereas the purple uh, magenta uh, California fish have these dives going down um, are deeper. But overall, both fish are both fish groups um, are spending most of their time at the surface. If we look at temperature, these are the same uh, density histograms. Um, the Alaska fish are occupying temperatures of around 11 degrees C and the California fish are occupying around 12 and a half to 13 degrees C. And this largely reflects the environments in which they are found. So if we think about the temperature that's available to them, uh, it can kind of explain some of their movements, or at least we can try and infer um, their temperature preferences from the movements. So this is looking at sea surface temperature, that's what the uh, color of the water is and their migrations. This is just for the 2019 Alaska fish. And as the Gulf of Alaska is warming, those fish are hugging the uh, coast and traveling to that cooler um, Aleutian Island region. And similarly, when we look at these California fish, um, as the warmer water is moving up, as we move towards summer, the fish are moving north on a cool uh, coastal band relatively cool, I should say. And this is a Hovmuller diagram, so I'm gonna walk through this, but we have Alaska turned on its side um, to orient you. The y-axis is longitude. And so the date is uh, going across the x-axis. And these dark points are each of the tracks from both of our seasons. So the left, those are the six tracks of the fish that exited the estuary um, in 2018. And we had the one long track that made it out to the Aleutians. And those dark tracks on the right side are our 2019 field season and our 
fish that exited the river and we had that one fish that made the long uh, tracked the Aleutian Islands and turn, started turning back. And so that's that curve in the line at the lower right corner. Um, and then temperature is the color that's filling in. Um, and so we can see that the Gulf of Alaska is, is that yellow warming uh, color in the summer in those two seasons. Um, and it looks like that these fish are following a, a temperature band that may be their optimal temperature. Looking at the California fish, um, now longitude is not on the y-axis, we have latitude. Um, so this one's a little bit more intuitive to follow their movements moving up the California coast. Um, they are, we have the three fish that were not ingested in these tracks here. Um, and they again are following this, this temperature band, this, which may be this temperature preference and explain some of their movements uh, horizontally. Now to think about their, um, what may be restricting their uh, vertical movements. Um, we have uh, two example tracks. So this is an example fish from Alaska on the north, on the top and an example fish from California on the bottom. And this is o OFES modeled temperature by depth data. Um, and it's the same color scale representing temperature in each figure. Um, the California figure goes a bit deeper. You can see the y-axis is depth, um, uh, but it's, it's just not getting as cold with depth in the California water column. Um, it's a more gradual thermocline than the Alaskan waters. And the thermocline in Alaska appears more structured. After 20 to 30 meters, it gets quite a bit colder with the, that's the darker blue there. Um, so this tells us that it's possible that temperature may be limiting the diving uh, by Alaskan fish. And this is something we've only just started to investigate. Uh, so there's a lot more to explore there. So in summary, steelhead kelts migrate along the continental shelf. Um, this is not widely known. Um, a lot of, of information about steelhead and uh, coastal movements are from, uh, not Celts, which we studied, but uh, smolts, the juveniles that recently exited the river. Um, and so this is, this is new information for understanding steelhead um, and thinking about the Celt movements that do, do differ from the juvenile movements that are more well known. Uh, migrations are highly directed. They are moving in a uni, unidirectional way um, towards what we can assume are their foraging grounds, but it's a little bit early to make assumptions about their behavior as far as feeding at this point. Californian Celts dive more than Alaskan Celts, uh, but overall they're generally surface oriented. Temperature may be limiting uh, and influencing both the horizontal movements of where they're trying to migrate to or where they happen to be migrating to, um, and also their vertical movements as far as uh, how much they can dive uh, and how that varies um, with where they are moving. So for next steps, we are investigating more environmental correlates. We've really only just begun uh, looking at temperature. And Maybe their dives aren't directly limited by temperature. Maybe it's prey sources um, that differ in where they're located in California versus Alaskan waters. Um, maybe it's their ability to visually hunt and see at deeper depths. So maybe the light attenuation is something we should investigate in each of these water columns. Um, and understanding productivity may help us infer why they are migrating to the places that they are. Uh, we also want to examine movement rates uh, especially with respect to currents. Uh, that'll help us understand the energy expenditure that, and uh, these migrating trade-offs uh, for migrating great distances. And I talked briefly about sort of some of the assumed predations um, and we had other mortalities as well that were uh, unable to identify. They weren't consumed, um, ingested. The light did not go to zero. Um, but they still may have been uh, 
predated upon by predators that could have been uh, sea lions that grab them, toss them, rip them apart, eat them, but don't actually consume the tag itself, um, or orcas. These are all likely possibilities, um, and figuring that out will be uh, interesting and difficult. <laughs> um, our plans have slightly changed. Uh, we did deploy five tags in Scott Creek earlier this spring, um, but whether or not we can deploy tags um, in Alaska um, in, let's see, the plan was a little over a month. We'll see how that goes um, and whether or not that happens or if it gets delayed a year or not, but we are uh, planning on tagging more fish and we do have five out from Scott Creek right now where we have not heard back from them. Um, and so those are our, our plans right now and the current progress in this project. And just to acknowledge Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, as well as the Coastal Marine Institute and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management funded this work. Uh, NOAA Fisheries and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, provided a lot of, of logistical support that was, is significant. Um, and there was a lot of field assistance from many people that made this happen. Uh, tagging takes a lot of people to uh, successfully execute. Um, and so we're grateful to everybody who was able to do that. Uh, Professor Logan asked that I talk a little bit about how I use illustration in science. So I'm going to end on kind of a light note there that isn't directly related to my work now. It's more uh, enrichment for myself. Um, but I'm going to talk about scientific art or sci art and, the and as a perspective of somebody who's not a scientific illustrator. I'm not a professional, um, but I do think this informs my science and helps it. So I'm not a scientific illustrator. Uh, I largely do this because I enjoy it, but it does serve a purpose for me. Uh, I share on social media and I participate in hashtags like Sunday Fish Sketch or Cephalopod Saturday um, so that the work reaches a wider audience. Uh, I always include a biological or ecological fact, um, like for those two images that are on the left, or I'll include a link uh, so that people can learn more, like the viper fish in the bottom right has a link to a Mbari video of a, a viper fish. Um, I also use it to promote my friends and colleagues. Uh, the white shark image um, has a link to my colleagues like recently published paper about white sharks. Um, and art and science have always been interlinked. Uh, all the early natural scientists uh, were artists because to describe a new species, you had to illustrate them. Uh, Ernest Haeckel, who's the, the artist who did the image of the cephalopods on the right, uh, is one such famous one. John James Audubon, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Charles Darwin, uh, everybody uh, were artists. And even today, though we have pho photographs to document uh, new species, we still need scientific illustrators uh, such as those coming out of CSUMB, uh, to highlight defining features that photos cannot. Uh, but what about for non-professionals? Um, I think this ESA blog I have a link here to uh, is a good resource um, that describes how sketching can enhance your science. So for example, drawing can describe discoveries and processes. This is kind of the traditional view um, of these kind of early illustrators that I described. Uh, but it can also aid in learning and memorization, which I definitely do. Clarify what you know and what you don't know. So it can help me realize, oh, I don't know where the pelvic fin actually fits relative to the adipose fin, which one is further forward on the body or not. Um, and so it can help you identify those things that you don't know offhand. Um, and it can enhance creativity and problem solving. In our department, we often use uh, visual storyboarding bo to draw out the figures uh, that are gonna go into a paper. Um, and it's a method of, of brainstorming. It can also enhance communication efforts, uh, both to the wider public as far as outreach, but also within your scientific community. So as far as the aid in learning and memorization, this is a quick, you know, uh, simple sketch that I did um, when I was taking a seaweed workshop, uh, macroalgae. And 
I just use this to learn the species of uh, the Cryptopleura genus and kind of highlight those differences between them. I also use it to help out organizations that I work with um, on the left Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, social media team was uh, having the scientists uh, in, in our organization participate in a hashtag that was just like a silly MS paint your science. So I did that scribbly little turtle for them there. Um, but I've also done uh, these kind of logo designs for other organizations I've worked with. And I've also taken to illustrating talks when I go to conferences. Um, it started as a way for me to focus on the talks during multiple day, all day sessions. Um, but I realized it actually helped me synthesize the information in a speaker's talk, because I had to think more about it to more simply like draw the important parts of a talk rather than just scribbling down notes um, as they were going. Uh, and then it turned out that when I shared them, it was a way to network with people at the conference. So this is somebody who replied to me because I share these and said, this is awesome. Will you come to my talk and do mine? And so it was a great way to actually network at a conference that was really large. Um, and it's probably a good strategy for introverts to be able to network. Um, it's a fairly minimally stressful way to do it. Um, but overall, it's just a fun thing for me. Uh, and it can get non-scientists interested in your work. So I created a 12 days of fish miss with each day adding a new illustration, several of which are here. Um, and while this is just light and fun, I would include like a species fact with each day. Um, and I got reactions from strangers like this. Um, so you can't get people to care about your science if they don't know about it. And art is one way to reach a wider audience than maybe a publication might. Um, so you can kind of get them to come for the art, but stay for the science is kind of my strategy. So I encourage any of you who enjoy making art to share it with me or participate in those kind of fun hashtags like Sunday Fish Sketch or Fishmas, um, because it's a great way to reach a lot of people um, and you can get your science out there um, to people who otherwise maybe wouldn't have access to it. And I'm gonna stop there and I think we're going to stop screen sharing and I will get questions from participants. So thank you. Oh, I think it got unmuted, but that's actually the applaud symbol. <laughs> I'm applauding. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have questions, but your art is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Emily, uh, thanks so much for your talk. That was that was great. Um, you know, I did some research up in Yakutat uh, collecting lingcod, and that place is amazing. So that's really cool. You've been able to spend some time up there. Oh, did you? Um, yeah, Yakutat is beautiful. It wasn't a place yeah. I had really even heard of before this uh, research project, but now I'd recommend it to anybody, especially uh, those interested in fishing. It's a great place for fishing. Yeah, exactly. So I had a question about. Um, the California steelhead and and what you think might be happening. I mean, the tags didn't stay on too long, but do you think they travel all the way up to Alaska and mix with the other population? Or do you think they only go so far and then sort of migrate back to their uh, California streams? That's a great question. And that's kind of our missing piece of this puzzle. Um, based on the previous work uh, from Sean Hayes and Noah colleagues, we think they go all the way up. Um, 
the part we don't know is, and based on our work, it looks like they go up along the coast, um, at least through California. That's as far as we were able to track them. Um, but whether they are turning off into Gulf of Alaska and feeding there, or following what our Alaska fish are doing and heading further as far as they can out to the Aleutians, we really don't know. Um, based on the, the length of the migration, it, it seems pretty amazing for them to actually go all the way to the Aleutians, the California fish. Um, so it's possible that they are just going out into the Gulf of Alaska and feeding there. But really, we just need these current tags that are on the fish to stay on for longer, we're hopeful, um, and need to wait for this field season's data to come back. And then one a separate question. Um, I'm just kind of curious, do you know much about the status of the steelhead population down in, in Big Creek, down in Big Sur? A lot of us go diving down there and we always see the smolts sort of hanging out in the, in the river and stuff as it flows into the ocean. I was just curious kind of if, if you've done any work there or, or know what's happening with that population. I haven't worked there. I know that's, um, that's the south central distinct population segment. So it's, yeah, a different population segment um, than the central coast. It's also threatened. Um, and I know Big Creek for that region, I think is one of the bigger steelhead populations. Um, but in general that <laughs> Southern California and Southern Central California are, are struggling. Um, so I, yeah, I, I can't answer that fully, but Big Creek for that region is, is a good um, stronghold for steelhead. Great, thanks. So I'll mute and to take your next question. Looks like I have a question in the chat I, from Jim Harvey. Uh, I'll just read it out. What is the genetic history of steelhead? Are they more derived than salmon? So are they doing something different than salmon? Uh, I don't know if they are more derived than salmon. salmon. Um, they are definitely doing a different thing than salmon, but it's, steelhead are, are unique, but there are others. Um, Atlantic salmon um, also have some similarities to steelhead and these diverse life history strategies. Um, and then there's some uh, interesting cutthroat trout or uh, Dolly Varden behaviors that are kind of similar, these diverse life history strategies. And so I don't know the, the genetic basis for all of this, um, but it seems like it, it may have evolved multiple times um, across groups. Was there someone that was speaking? That had their hand raised. Uh, this is Mike Prince. Looks like I was just unmuted. And I had my hand raised. Um, All right, go ahead. I was uh, when I was in the Coast Guard. I was stationed in Yakutat, uh, as the commanding officer of the Coast Guard station there. And, you know, fish on the SeaTac River all the time. So enjoyed seeing that part of your talk. Oh wow, that's great. My, yeah. My question is. My question is um, is is it possible to have the a longer duration on the tags or some way to get tags on the fish later in the season so you can see whether or not they return back or you know what their pattern is uh, longer than the six months yeah that is a good question um it is very convenient for us to tag uh the fish at the weirs in the river um the fish are all trapped there by the weir um, before they are counted and let along their way. Um, so it would be possible if there were other fishing, either commercial or research special vessels that were going out into the Gulf of Alaska or the Aleutians, um, if we were able to piggyback on those kind of expeditions and tag there, we would maybe be able to get the return tag. Um, of all the tags we put out, uh, which is 16, five and 12. Yeah. Um, we really only got two fish that had the tag stay on them for the full, uh, nearly six month deployment. Um, so I don't think just changing the deployment on the fish, tagging them at the same time that we're tagging them and then trying to hope that the, that a tag stays on for a full year is the way to go. I think like what you're suggesting, tagging them at a different point in their migration would be the way to answer that question. 
Um, and so that would be, yeah, an entirely different kind of tagging approach um, that would be really interesting to do, um, either us or, or others if, if they had the opportunity to. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier, that's for sure. Thank yeah. You. Hello, Emily, this is Rick Starr. Hi. Hi, um, enjoyed your presentation. Um, I really was interested in hearing that the steelhead are staying on the shelf uh, as they move north. And so uh, this is a question that's interested me for a long, long time. And you may not have the data uh, yet, but I'm curious to know if you see uh, fish avoiding strong um, plumes of fresh water coming down uh, through the rivers. In other words, do they go, they stay in the shallow and then move out to the edge of the shelf as they go north to go around fresh water, or are they going uh, through fresh water plumes? Um, and just wondered if you had any information about that. That's a great question. Um, we haven't looked at that yet, but I think some of our data would be able to help us understand that as they pass through these plumes. Um, the San Francisco Bay plume would be the first really, really major one that they would hit. Um, and so we have three fish that made it past there um, that would be able to see that for. Um, and then our Alaska fish as well. Uh, some of those river systems would be able to see. We haven't looked at that yet, but I think that's a, a great thing to investigate. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, I see there's a question in the chat. Uh, so what is the advantage of staying close to the coast and staying in the upper water column? Um, from what we're seeing, it seems like the coast does provide some cooler water at the surface um, than sort of the, the warming water that's just offshore. Um, so it might be that they are thermally restricted to staying near that cooler coastal water. Um, and that might be because for California, it's an upwelling system. Um, for Alaska, they're getting that very cold uh, glacier runoff from rivers closer to the coast. Um, and staying in the upper water column might also be a thermal, thermal refuge, but in this case might be slightly more uh, temperature, warmer temperatures they might be seeking there. Um, so finding that perfect balance. But uh, it also is likely related to where their prey is located and how they fish or about how they hunt. Um, so uh, that's stuff that we're still investigating, but our data may not even be able to answer all of those questions. Uh, I had a question in the chat. Do you know what the size difference between the two populations is due to? Um, part of that is so the, the Sea-Tuck River in Alaska, that population is the largest for steelhead for all of that whole region, um, the Southeast Alaska region. Um, and so there might be some historical reasons. It has been a big population. It continues to be a big population. Um, but that river uh, supports several species of salmon. Um, it's a very productive river. Um, and people are interested in why that is because it is a short, relatively short river. Um, and the main theory that they have proposed is just that it's fed from a lake. And so it's this consistent supply of water um, across years. And that consistency supports the, the large population. Um, and then for Scott Creek, um, a lot of the coastal streams, uh, those populations along California um, have been struggling for quite a while. Um, and that is for a variety of reasons, but often related to the, the frequent droughts we've had. Um, if your question was related to the size difference of the individuals, um, 
that is a general latitudinal trend, I believe. Um, and it might be related to uh, their diet. So these waters that are in Northern um, Pacific along the Aleutians in the Gulf of Alaska are very, very productive. The California current is productive as well, but there are many species that make huge migrations all the way up to Alaska just for that food. Uh, if we think about whales, um, other anadromous fish like sturgeon. Um, so this is a common pattern. So there is likely uh, a reason why all these fish, at, fish and other species at the southern end of, the, of North America um, are making these migrations. And it's likely that this energy expenditure means that these are smaller steelhead, smaller individuals, rather than the fish that don't have to make as long of migrations that are in Alaska, just going to Alaskan waters. I think that's all of our questions. I think. Oh, this Cheryl? is just Scott. Yeah, so I just want to thank everyone and thank our speaker. Uh, that was really excellent, Emily. And yeah, thanks everyone for attending and for uh, participating and uh, asking lots of great questions. So, thank you so much for having me. Hopefully, soon we'll meet in person. Yes, hopefully, very soon. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Thank you.